I am old enough, as you can see from when I was born, 1937, I'm old enough to know the two great figures in the beginning of theoretical and physical chemistry in China. These are Tang Aoqing and Lu Jesse. And it was my good fortune to get to know them first through the literature, which was not easy in the time of the Cultural Revolution, um, rem remotely by writing to them. Uh, I got to know them even in the 1960s, but then in 1982, I came to China and I met them both in person and they had a tremendous influence on me intellectually. Uh, and I have valued that association with Professors Tang and Lu, who in turn have taught your teachers. So they are your teacher grandfathers, um, and they are very important. What you see Professor Tang doing is an interesting circle because he's standing at the board and what he's doing is he's explaining the, the explanation that Woodward and I gave for the stereochemistry of certain re reactions, so-called electrocyclic reactions or cycloadditions. And what he's pointing to is uh, a correlation diagram between the levels of such, of such, uh, of, of such, in such reactions. So this is Professor Tang talking in Changchun, actually, about my work, which is an interesting circle to have. Okay. The talk I'm giving today is based on three essays by myself and Jean-Paul Malrieu. Um, and Jean-Paul Malrieu is a brilliant theoretician, approximately my age, just a little younger. And it's a miracle we got these papers published in Angevand Chimie. They are three long essays, each closely printed 20 to 30 pages, and in English that is not easy to read, uh, not easy to read. But I think for those of you who try it to improve your vocabulary, uh, it will be rewarding reading because I hope it will make you think. And that is what this seminar is about. This seminar will teach you nothing about artificial intelligence, but I'm hoping that it will leave you with some ideas to think about in your other time and together with your friends and how I wish that we had the time to talk about. Here is a picture of Jean-Paul Malrieu. Um, and, uh, you can see him at the right and me at left. And what I want to tell you is what I think all of you know, or that's where I would like to begin. It feels like we are under a wave all around us. Simulation and the use of artificial intelligence is growing. It's clearly helping us, but is there also some danger in this? Or is this wave of artificial intelligence not only unavoidable, oh, it will happen, but is it also good in some absolute sense? This is part of what I want us to think about. There is a tension between simulation and understanding. And it's there, of course, not only in chemistry, but also in physics and in every branch of science and outside of science in society. There are deep moral implications 
of artificial intelligence and information technology for all of us. We will survive this wave as it descends on us. Uh, but yet Jean-Paul and I do worry about where we are heading. But we sketch a future of consilience, which is a complicated word for living together, uh, for jumping into the wave together, so to speak. And toward the end of the talk, we will go somewhere where even if you follow us through the beginning of the story, you may not find that you want to go there because what we are going to claim is, or we think that perhaps that chemistry's particular aspect of making molecules of creation and of making theories provides in that future, which is going to be shaped by artificial intelligence, a passage actually to art as much as science and to perceiving as we will argue, and this is what will be difficult for people to follow, for perceiving the sacred in science. That work is usually associated with the religions, but I don't want it associated with that. I will explain what I mean by that, uh, the, that we, we think it can lead a passage to that. Along the way, there will be a plea and very specific advice for how to stay human as this wave of artificial intelligence descends on us and how to make your tools human. Throughout this, we're going to talk in terms of a triangle, a triangle of mental things, theory, simulation, mostly numerical, and an understanding. And I will define all of these, but all of these ideas, theory, simulation, understanding, are moving in, especially in chemistry, surrounded and interacting at all times with experiment. Cannot move away from that. Chemistry remains an experimental science. And even though I do theory and I love it, it remains an experimental science. And that's going to be an important factor in keeping us together. So let's talk about these words, understanding, theory and simulation. So understanding. Uh, understanding is often tacit, meaning it's quiet, it's not spoken, it's a state of mind. It is often qualitative, though it can have quantitative features. Let me give you an example. People around the world have seen rainbows since the beginning of civilization. People were smart. They observed that the rainbows always formed opposite to the sun. They observed that they formed always after a rain or some water. Though there are rainbows in other circumstances, like when you have an oil slick but I'm talking about the normal rainbows that we usually refer to. And eventually they even measured that the high point of a rainbow was 42 degrees above the horizon. So those are observations. Eventually there came an understanding. The understanding was that the rainbow had something to do with the reflection, with the transmission, reflection, and refraction of light in droplets of water. That's why you needed the rain. And that, that is why it came always after rain. And eventually, after beginnings in uh, the Arab world, there came an eventual understanding of this and an and in the work of Descartes and Newton, eventually a derivation 
of why it was 42 degrees and not 67 and not 21, but 42 degrees. The quantitative supported the qualitative, but the qualitative was the explanation, not the quantitative. And that is something which we'll come back to. Okay, so explanation, a little different from explanation, is the expression of understanding. It's inherently more pedagogic. That's a fair, that's a fancy English word for teaching in nature. It's inherently, ex when you explain, yes, you explain to yourself, but most often you explain to somebody else. So it is teaching. And so explanation is inherently more teaching style. And it also is done in terms of telling a story or a narrative. It's pretty much impossible to separate explaining to oneself from explaining to others. I, think about it for yourself. This is an important, this is very important for those of you who may be resisting that your supervisor or your uh, department chairman is telling you it to teach a class. What they are doing is giving you the opportunity to understand. That is, this is an argument because understanding comes through teaching. This is an argument for focusing on the special role of teaching in under enhancing understanding, in ex enhancing understanding, not for the student, but for the teacher. Teaching forces you to explain. Teaching clarifies in a way which is unsurpassed for both teacher and student. This is nothing new. It was said by a Roman philosopher in Latin in this quotation. The second thing about ex explanation is explanations come to us through stories. That's what hypotheses are, stories. There is nothing wrong with storytelling. Human beings tell stories naturally and easily. There are other aspects which enter into understanding. A few more general comments about understanding. Understanding or explanation both have strong elements of uh, sequential causality. That is, you can think about writing a computer program. A goes to B, B goes to C, it has that built in. There is a little bit of tension in here because very often our human understanding of something is holistic in the sense that we see the whole thing rather than the pieces. So there is a tension between logical and sequential and seeing the whole thing at once or to be trying to see the whole thing at once. Another thing that's interesting is the role of chance of unplanned things, of arbitrary things. In modern times, chance plays an essential role. And in something like free energy and chemistry and the idea of entropy, uh, a definitely positive role. That is, disorder is the way things get done on average. There are many different ways of saying this. And modern science has come to peace with chance. One thing that's very difficult for people who are headed towards science is the idea of complementarity. The word is due to Niels Bohr. And this is the idea that there may be value to not one, but multiple explanations of any phenomenon. For instance, that a, a particle is described or light is described as both a wave and a particle. That is not giving up on getting an explanation that helps you understand it and it help, helps you to think about this. There are other instances, and uh, just for chemists in the audience, localized and delocalized ideas of bonding are very are very much that way um two two explanations that are complementary the words for 
for what happens when you explain something in European languages like elucidation, erklärung, eclaircissement in French, objasnění in Russian. Many of the words for understanding in um, in European languages relate to light. I didn't look up in Chinese what the right word is, but maybe one of you can supply it. There is the idea here of enlightenment. And with that idea, yes, there is a connection to enlightenment in the Buddhist sense. So there, there is a connection there. There is a special quality to understanding when it is achieved. And I think every one of you has felt it at some time. There is a special rise of the spirit, a kind of emotional surge when you attain understanding. And this is not to be suppressed or forgotten. It's an emotional response to a thought process, and it's a special quality which is actually spiritual and aesthetic. It comes from, it connects up with art, it connects up with the spiritual uh, when you see some an explanation forming in your mind. I have an operational definition of understanding um, to me of understanding in chemistry and physics. To me, understanding means knowing the mix of physical mechanisms uh, for why something is one way. Why is the dipole moment of this molecule that? Well, there may be several reasons, not just one. And then what you need to do is to make an order of magnitude estimate of the contribution of each of these. Uh, think of two molecules interacting six angstroms apart. Is it charges? Is it dipole moments? Is it quadrupole moments? You evaluate these and you make a, a decision that it's one of them and not another. Understand, so that's to me is what understanding is. Understanding also means to me being able to predict, to predict, I'll come back to that word, qualitatively the results of a reliable computation before the computation is made. Not quantitatively necessarily, but qualitatively. And that leads me to a operational test of understanding. Do a calculation of something, of a molecule. Before you do it, Predict qualitatively what will come out. Qualitatively. Order of magnitude. If it comes out right, try another molecule. If it comes out way off, then don't give up. Think. Improve your understanding until with enough thought you could kick yourself in the behind for not having seen that there is another factor that you omitted. And once you get that, you have improved your understanding. And now you check on your understanding, and now you get that number right, approximately. You don't stop there. You make a perturbation of the system. If you're a chemist, change a chlorine for an OH. Can you predict qualitatively how the property will change? Never stop when you change. If your answer to the question of what is this property of a molecule, like what is the dipole moment of, of methanol, if the answer is, I, I will have to calculate it, it's okay, you calculate it. And then someone says, you change the hydrogen for chlorine, what will happen to the di dipole moment? If you have to say, I have to go back and put it into the computer, then you don't understand it. And I want you to ask the question of who does. Does the computer understand it? Does the person who wrote the program understand it? Something to think about. Here is this triangle again. So let's talk about theory now. Theory is the, the definition in, in the dictionary, it's a coherent group of propositions 
which are used as principles of explanation. Now this theory is used to explain things for a class of phenomena. Theories give the answer to the question, to the why question. The usual reason why people accept certain theories and reject others is because you understand more with that theory that you don't understand with another. They explain more facts, more economically. You don't expect a theory to explain everything. I don't expect uh, I don't expect uh, the theory of uh, of uh, of why a mo molecule has a certain dipole moment to explain why my cousin wrote me such a letter. The, these you what you want is that at their edges the theories blend in understandable ways with existing theories that explain other pieces of the universe. But those are only some of the factors which go into accepting theories. One of the interesting one is people accept theories when they make risky predictions. What's a risky prediction? That's when 90% of the experts say it will not happen that way, and it happens that way. That's a risky prediction. Aesthetics, that's beauty. This is very dangerous very, very dangerous. This is the feeling that this theory must be right because the equations are simple and I can solve them. Boy, is that dangerous. Uh, that is, and that's, I'll say it another way. It's a belief that the world is as simple as your mind. And the world is not simple. The world is as complicated as it has to be. Telling good stories is important. Fitting in with society in certain ways we could talk about. That a theory is portable is very interesting. That you can, what I mean by portable is that you can give it to somebody else and they can do things with it. Not just that you can do things with it. Productivity, I mean that theory suggests experiments. Uh, I've written about this in an article that's here and we'll distribute a PDF copy of this or put this on a web. Theories are ephemeral. That just means that they are temporary. They last. They are improved. They're also dangerous, risky, powerful, and very satisfying. Prediction is the way that the passage between understanding and experiment is shaped. And it is very important. But uh, here it says in French, from the title of a French book by a distinguished mathematician, uh, René Tom, uh, to predict is not to explain. And I've already talked about that in other ways. Uh, I'll come back to that again. Um, let's go back to this. There's one more thing which I haven't talked to you about, which is also a passage between understanding and experiment and other things. And this is the building of models. Uh, there is a good book I can recommend here by Michael Weisberg about simulation and similarity using models to understand the world. But let's talk about simulation. Now, there are different kinds of simulation. There is analog simulation, which uh, has not been so popular lately. But wind tunnels, a very uh, for for seeing how an aircraft performs, have still retained their utility. That's an example of an analog simulation. Most simulations today are digital. Another thing about simulation, uh, another aspect of simulation, are what are called phenomenological models. So this is a fancy word, but let but they're simple to explain. These are simple models, the theoretical foundations of which are not yet clear, and sometimes one can even be sure that they are not derived from first principles, but they still correctly reproduce some or most properties of a set of molecules. A very good example is a Heisenberg Hamiltonian or a spin Hamiltonian, that S1 dot S2 a J dot times an S1 dot S2 represents the interaction of two radical centers. That's a 
that's a that's a phenomenological model to actually get what j is takes a lot a lot of calculation the third thing the application on a computer of the correct equations of the system which in our case is the schrodinger equation or the dirac equation uh, for molecules that's quantum mechanics and then we make approximation and then we do the solutions of these correct equations approximated. And this is in fact the meat and potatoes of our community of computational chemists. The quotation that's usually used by Paul by uh, Dirac is that the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics are thus completely known. He wrote this in 1929, three years after the invention of the new quantum mechanics. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much more complicated to be soluble. Usually the second part is not is forgotten, but I'm not gonna let it let you forget it this time. What he said, it therefore becomes desirable that a crop approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed, which can lead to an explanation of the main features of the complex atomic systems without too much computation. Note the valuation here of explanations, approximate, not too much calculation. One of the amusing things is uh, Dirac is standing in front of a, he was a physicist through and through, but he's standing in front of the potential energy curves for the hydrogen molecule, which is interesting. The kind of simulation which you are more used to is that involved in machine learning and neural networks. And you know what these are more, much better than I do and about how these work. One starts from a set of molecules, let's, and their known properties are very well calculated by the other methods. Call us the training set. One then writes a program that asks the computer to find the in complex, often, uh, relationships to observables. And one instructs the program to proceed to find the best fit, the best prediction of an observable driven only by agreement with the training data. And uh, neural networks is another way of structuring this. Uh, even I know more about this than I'm learning, but I, I don't wanna spend time on what, I'm, what I actually feel in this case is something that is well known to you. Now, this kind of thing is the wave that is descending on us, four and five. Three was before, but four and five is now coming on us. And it leads to a very good time for two situations. One is scientists writing reports about how good their work is to their bosses. And second, to the journalists that your scientific institutes and the scientific press hires. So it leads to things like this. Machine learning predicts electronic properties at relatively low computational cost. Machine learning makes light work of hard materials. Algorithm successfully identifies super hard compounds, eliminating the need for lengthy trial and error. What's hidden in those words is that it also eliminates the need for the people who are doing that trial and error, and that's you. So rather than talk about this, I want to tell you an example from my own work, because I want to give you a feeling for what it means to be beaten by computer by a computer in the process of and to be beaten by simulation of one kind or another in the process of doing some scientific work. 
So Neil Ashcroft, my collaborator, brilliant intuitive physicist, had a wonderful idea that in order to achieve a good conductivity and even superconductivity that we needed uh, and, and that, that we needed a material which had a lot of hydrogen in it and um, which somehow one introduced some other atoms, either main group or transition metals or lanthanides, in order to, in a way, this this distract the hydrogen molecules from repelling each other as the metal began to be formed under high pressure. And we needed to get the structures of SiH4 at high pressure. So we this was the beginning of our work on high pressure. There was a paper here, which as you see was published in the physics journal. And it turned out that the structure of silane, SiH4, one molecule suggested, one composition suggested by Ashkov, was not known. So I'm a chemist. I know SiH, silicon's on the carbon periodic table. SiH4 is going to be like methane. So that was one possible structure for SiH4. Now, I also knew that under high pressure, the structures often change from what they were under normal pressures. So I thought of other possible structural alternatives. I was in the field which some of you are in of structure searching. And I was using chemical intuition to suggest possible structures. For instance, I knew that silicon didn't mind being six coordinate. And the next three structures that you see here at the bottom all have six coordinate silicon in them. And the one in the middle, for instance, is the structure of tin tetrafluoride, SNF4, at, under normal pressure. So I thought, well, maybe that might be a structure for the silicon at high pressure. And then we let the program optimize at some point. As the pressure elevated, it went through these structures, but then went into a new structure in which each silicon was eight coordinate. Here are these polyhedra. Green is hydrogen. Gold is silicon. There is a gold in the middle of each polyhedron. This polyhedron, which I'm pointing to, is stripped away. As you see, it has eight silicon, eight hydrogens connected to that silicon. So please don't think that this is silicon H8, because each hydrogen here is shared with another silicon. So this is silicon H8 over two, or it's silicon H4. And in this, I would need, I have the same number of electrons, I have the same material, but it must be bonded in some different way. We came upon this structure. We were very happy when we did this. Within one year, other structures were suggested, like the one that you see at right here, uh, let me just turn this off. But you see it right here, a structure which is like one we have, but instead of each silicon sharing eight hydrogens, that silicon still shares eight hydrogens. We could count them around this one, but it shares them to a piece with four neighboring silicons. And when I see this, I see immediately think of diborane. And when I see this SIHSI, I think of a three-center, two-electron bond. OK, the structured right was found by Pickard and Neves within a year of what we did. And everyone then jumped into the business of predicting the structure of SIH4, the lowest enthalpy structure. And here is the sad story I have to report to you. Every method which involved simulation, random searching, or genetic algorithms, or simulated annealing, or minimal hopping, all of these simulation methods beat us every time since. OK, what do I mean beat us? They found a lower energy structure. Okay, 
So what's the first reaction uh, on being beaten by a computer? It's no different from being beaten by a computer at chess or elsewhere, uh, but it's, it's a, this is a very complicated game of chemistry. The computer finds the lowest energy structure, but it was we and not the computer who sees in both structures the presence of eight electron deficient, two electron, three center bonds. Ah, it seems like that's not worth thinking about, but to me, it's worth thinking about. It makes a connection to diborane. It makes a connection to lots of other structures. It gives me a way of thinking about these sanguine structures, other structures that are formed. And I see a connection. And that connection is one of the clues to a future which I want to describe for you. But meanwhile, I keep fighting. I would say in my belligerent mode, in my warlike mode in this SI story, is that the computer has calculated faster and reached a, a result that is better. Well, that's, that's what it can do. But it found a structure, but it understands nothing of the underlying chemistry of physics. We have entered a great intellectual debate of our time, and that is on artificial intelligence. This is a philosophy debate, and it was done it's been around in philosophy for 40 years and uh, 50 years. There was a, uh, an argument introduced by a philosopher who, before there was Google Translate, before DeepL, imagined a room into which a Chinese text was put in. There was a person sin sitting inside the room who didn't know any Chinese, but he had all the books in the world and maybe he had Google Translate today, and he took the slip of paper with a Chinese word, and he looked it up, and he put out a translation through another slit, and to the person outside, it looked like the person in the room knew Chinese. Of course, he didn't know Chinese. Uh, and so that's the that has been a subject of discussion for 40 to 50 years, and there are traces of it going much older than that. The situation became real with, uh, in other ways, through chess playing programs and eventually even Go ego programs that could uh, that could uh, defeat the best players in the world. And the situation today is such that Google, Microsoft, etc., are hiring our people for hundreds of thousands of dollars to perfect quantum computers. Quantum computing dominates the advertising hype. And the situation in reality is such that for small molecules, quantum computing has solved Schrodinger's equation more accurately than any other calculation. It will soon do so for larger molecules. The best numbers of the future will be provided by quantum computing. The ideal situation, the ideal simulation, which gives all observables accurately then from the correct density for the molecule. The interesting thing is, and that's a sideline, is that some of those observables that the uh, quantum computing will give you are some are some that are difficult, if not impossible, to measure. So that's very interesting. But just focusing on the ones that one can measure, it'll provide numbers in total agreement with experiment. So experiment will be revised if the numbers do not agree. And I would say it'll provide no understanding. Okay, so we're going to have a fighting dialogue. I will say I have a way of understanding the physics and the chemistry approximately. And my opponent in quantum computing simulation uh, neural networks will say, bah, if you don't get the number right, you don't understand it. You're just hand waving. And I would say, I do understand it. Understanding is qualitative. I just told you. 
If I tweak the molecule a little, I'll tell you whether its color changes in the direction of the red or the blue. If I ask you what happened, you will just tell me that I should wait a minute and you will compute it for me. And when are you going to get that chip implanted so you can skip the waiting so that you look like a character in the movie Matrix? Oh, it's just a little, just to lower the tone, here is a little drawing from Jean-Paul Maurier, who does little cartoons. He says to the calculator, say, calling to Athena, the goddess of wisdom, he says, wait a minute, it converges. Uh, typical saying. So my opponent, the, the simulation uh, says, guy says, nasty, nasty. Eventually we'll have AI that explains what it does. Or that explanation will emerge from having just many correct numbers to clever people. Or people will do accurate numerical calculations designed not for numbers, but to furnish what you call understanding. My answer is, I doubt it. I think there is something in the psychology of a programmer, a hacker, a computer, a writer of computer programs that is not tuned in to getting explanations. It wants answers, things that give the correct answer. Writing programs and debugging them leads you away from thinking there might even be a simple explanation. And uh, the, the, the dialogue continues, but let me, since I'm giving the talk, I'll give you, I'll try to say it in a third and as provocative way as I can to you. Uh, people are now uh, in this situation where after you do a training set of molecules, you can write uh, neural network programs that'll predict the energy of any molecular geometry with a better number, a lower energy than any calculation uh, can do, any approximate calculation, quantum mechanical calculation will do. And so, I, I said it here in a different way. In view of the progress of machine learning and neural networks, it's likely that these tools will compete efficiently in quality and cost. That's not quantum computer, but just neural networks right now. With, that these will compete with the best quantum chemistry tools. So what's going to happen to the community of quantum chemists or computational chemists? They will face a dramatic problem. Will their function be relegated to providing reliable training data sets for the production of improved neural networks? Or are they going to follow the destiny of supermarket cashiers these days and that of taxi drivers tomorrow? So here is the pessimistic prediction. There's going to be a little mark of money marking died 2022, next to quantum chemistry. Is that what we want to have? There is a way out. But before I tell you of my way out, I want to tell you of the dangers to society. Uh, they are so obvious, and they're best told through stories that illustrate it. They are always stories of people misusing computers, AI, neural networks. Okay, so let me preface them by saying it is in the nature of human beings that they will misuse any, that some of them, some of them will misuse any tool that is put in the hand of human beings. If you doubt that, just take a look at some uncensored website or the comments that people put after a song or something like that. So here are three stories. Uh, one is buying for babies. So this Target is a department store in the United States. And this guy worked as a statistician for Target. And 
uh, I don't have time to tell you the whole story. I'll just tell it to you in words. Uh, some colleagues came to him and said, can you predict um, uh, w can you predict for us when a woman will buy things for a baby? Um, and they did some, they set up some tests for that, and they found that they could predict very well from the buying patterns of young women. Uh, and when they were pregnant and expecting a child. Now this turned into sending out letters to their homes, advertising diapers and other baby things. And in some cases, the young people had not told their parents that they were pregnant. So you can see the problem. Now, this is something that not all computers are equal. It has been shown at least in the past, that a travel website has charged people who approach that travel site via computer, of course, and the travel site could tell whether they were on a Mac computer or on a Windows computer, and it charged them for the same trip a higher price if they came from a Mac computer than from a Windows computer. You will have to figure out why. It's not hard. Here's another one. Uh, Michael Kaczynski at Stanford got hold of 200 pictures of people and their profiles on a, a dating site. And the people identified their sexual preferences, male, 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 female, uh, female, female as well as their pictures. He then did a correlation and between um, a deep neural network, a facial recognition algorithm, and found he could predict with five pictures the sexuality preference of a man with 91%. No human being doing that could do it with better than about 60%. Okay, that sounds innocent, it sounds even funny, but it's not funny when this hands in, gets in the hands of something that's making, uh, that's making judgments about people. Uh, now, I don't have to tell you about other things. Surveillance, uh, I'm not going to tell you about how, about the prevalence of surveillance uh, cameras in, in your own country. There are military uses. Um, the, um, there are military experts and roboticists who have argued that autonomous weapon system should be regarded not only as morally acceptable, but also they are ethically superior to human fighters. And someone has written that the robots of the future will be able to act more humanely on a battlefield, wielding lethal weapons, because they need not be programmed with a self-preservation instinct, therefore eliminating the need for a shoot first, ask questions later attitude. Ah, this is beyond belief that people could think about such things. Taking a life, even just hurting someone, is not something that can be delegated to an algorithm. With that action comes moral responsibility. This is not the place for artificial intelligence. Um, so we stop, the two of us. And we, at this point, it was too easy to find ludicrous examples of artificial intelligence, absolutely crazy ways of use and of abuse on the web. And so we stopped and we looked for good things. We looked, we looked for where people would learn some science for theoretical studies which lead not just to numbers but to understanding. We found a few, 
Here is a wonderful study by um, Frances Arnold at Caltech where she looked at an organic reaction where you make a carbon-silicon bond uh, and uh, you attach that bond over here and you can do that with, with the silicon attacking from the top or the silicon attacking from the bottom uh, of this group, which initially starts out as a, as a uh, double bond to this N2. And she, they could evolve using both artificial intelligence and genetic engineering enzymes that would catalyze the formation of this bond with preference for 93% of one enantiomer. Okay, that was great. That was much better than anyone had done before. But then these people did something incredible. They came up using the same techniques with something, with an enzyme, another enzyme, that will provide the same molecule's mirror image. So the, what's called in chemistry the enantiomer of it. That's pretty amazing. Here's a study from solid state physics, amorphous silicon. Some of the people studied whole trap decks. And I was so interested in reading the end result of this in that it did not say, I have designed the world best whole trap death material. Um, I don't even know if you need large or small whole trap death. But what it did was they tried to describe these in terms of chemical bonding. So they said that this genetic and engineer programming led to a five-fold coordinated silicon to regions in which silicon was dense and to bridge bonds. You remember those bridge bonds in my SIH4 structure? That kind of bond. And now that was that was that was understanding. So in general, can AI move beyond just getting numbers? And this is a subject that's discussed um, by in the literature. Not only is it discussed. There is money to do this. DARPA, Defense Agency in the United States, is funding projects on explainable AI so that you can move from beyond a neural network to tell you a dog from a cat, but to go to something which can tell you what are the characteristics of a cat, and it can tell you that in human words. Uh, those are interesting things. So I think that simulation and big data cannot be stopped. Some of it is welcome. Music choices, fingerprint re recognition, even self-driving cars, perhaps. Uh, some uses raise great ethical questions. Um, should insurers have the right to demand your DNA? and to set your premiums based on it. Should your prospective marriage partner, or worse, their parents, have the right to see that DNA? And it should be clear, absolutely clear, to every one of us who has watched the web that while ethics is as much a fundamental human social invention as science and technology, that the implementation of ethics and law clearly lags behind technological change. We're always catching up. People are abusing technological inventions. And it's it, so, how do we live in that world? Um, Jean Paul and I started out by uh, looking at our own work and looking for how we need simulations, and I don't have time to tell you that story, but in the article you can read about it. I took a story from my own work of alkali metal hydrides and halides. Actually, it's not my own work. It's the work of Eva Zurek 
and Artemogonos. There are unusual compounds formed, not only NaCl and LiH, but other stoichiometries. You need the calculations to tell you which stoichiometry, why it's NaCl3 and not NaCl4. But then what is the bonding in these like is what needed an explanation. So what we looked for is where you needed calculations and I found it in my own work. And then we supplied an explanation because I was looking for the clues about supplying explanations, about how to, uh, there's so many ways of saying it, how to add value to numbers, how to go beyond the numerical, how to reach understanding. Yes, enlightenment is understanding, not the numbers, at least for this theoretician. Jean Paul looked at something else. He looked at two copper radicals, something he's been working on for 50 years. And he wanted to understand the interaction between two copper two centers, each with one unpaired electron, uh, and what is the extent of the coupling of those two. And he went through a story of 40 years of slowly straight of understanding, of doing better calculations, of getting explanations from the calculations, which could then lead you to the next calculation to try um, and to reach an understanding of what caused the coupling between those two electrons. I want to talk to you finally about, we looked at these things and we looked at something that I can leave with you about, first of all, something in terms of hints or clues or suggestions for what you should do to escape what we think, Trump Paul and I, is not a good goal, which is just to get a better number about how to reach understanding. So what we thought about strategies to remain human and in a world where simulation is all around us and is only going to uh, to lead us, lead to, to more of it, you can't escape it. So one general strategy is to let experiment lead you. Uh, theory, simulation, understanding are embedded in experiment. Experimentalists quite naturally address two types of demands to theoreticians. If you think about it, and I want you to think about it, what does your experimental friend want from you if you are a theoretician? So one is qualitative. Can you explain to me this property of a set of molecules? Your experimental friend is not a student who is looking for an answer on an exam. They are looking for understanding. They want to know what they can use in their work that will help them explain something, like a property of a set of molecules. But just as often, the experimentalists, because they are experimentalists, are looking for numbers. They really want to know the value of the coupling constant between the two coppers when the coppers are in certain environment. They want to have the value of the property of that molecule. It's human to both want numbers and to want understanding. And what a joy to get both. But I tell you, and getting the numbers is much easier than getting understanding. But why should you seek the easy? Seek the difficult. A second strategy for remaining human 
move up one meta level. Um, and this is to the relationship of things, facts, or molecules to each other. A computer can do the statistics of various more stable force forms, plotting common features, but it can't discuss the chemical bonding on a level that we teach it in a beginning class in high school or in college. You remember that structure which simulation found that was better than my structure? That simulation did not see the three center bonds that relate the bonding in that structure to that in diborane. This, that bonding relationship is a meta level up. It's the connection of things to each other. It's seeing the forest instead of the trees. There are a number of different ways of saying it. Okay, the third strategy for remaining human in a time of simulation is very simple. It's play. Uh, and there is a Latin phrase, homo ludens, man the, the game player. When someone puts a tool in your hand, the world's best program for calculating a number, don't just calculate what needs to be calculated. If you have a reliable tool, play with it. Try out things. Just ask yourself, what's going to happen to that molecule if I take a hydrogen off and put an NO2 group instead? And you do this game playing. Yes, it's fun, but you do it to build understanding. That was one of my uh, definitions of how to build understanding is to keep on playing games with a computer. Um, the fourth strategy for staying human is to teach. If someone brings you the result of a simulation, ask that person, what have you learned from getting that number that I can teach to others? Don't allow anyone to escape teaching meaning not to explain their numbers, and even encourage people to teach in classes, because I think that's a structure that pushes you toward explaining. And the fifth strategy for remaining human is to ask the difficult question of why. With all the subjectivity that inevitably surrounds that question, it's an important one, and asking that question builds a passage between the sciences and the arts and the humanities. And now I come to the things which are, which I think will be, are difficult for some people to follow. And sometimes John Paul and I are not that sure about these two, but it's something that comes out of our psychology comes out of something I said before, first of all, and that is a realization that there is some special quality when you gain understanding. There's a kind of emotional surge you get. Maybe you remember what you felt when you first saw Pythagoras theorem, or when you first saw a simple proof of Pythagoras theorem. Um, that, that emotional surge is, or I experienced it when I first saw the explanation of why electrocyclic reaction went the way it did and the special role of the highest occupied molecular orbital and how they changed. It was, it was a moment, wasn't, it wasn't, I'm not talking about the eureka moment, that I got it. No, I'm talking about the feeling, the, feel, the emotional feeling that comes from having understood the thing. And I think that's a spiritual link between science and art, and I'm not afraid of that word. Uh, I think that chemistry will respond to its necessary coexistence with AI. 
and you don't have to follow me there. By developing still further, it's storytelling and extreme in and aesthetic side. Let me paint for you a picture. I should have I should have painted it blue, but I'm not I'm not a good artist. I already think that science has the feeling of a a great kind of building palace of the mind. And it's like a museum of masterpieces. And what's hanging in that museum? In one room hang the Cassini mission images of the lakes of the surface of Titan, a moon of Jupiter. Um, the, those lakes are made out of liquid methane and ethane at 90K. But they are clearly lakes. We have pictures of them. In another room hangs the discovery of archaea, of extremophiles, that there are organisms that can live at 100 C in pH 2 and in pH 12, and how their lipids differ from each other, that life is possible under extreme conditions. In the third room, I see a mathematical proof on Sager's solution of the two-dimensional icing problem, as beautiful today as it was in 1943 when it was published. In another room, I see Woodward's and Eschenmoser's synthesis of coenzyme B12. This museum is a sacred space. These are artistic and scientific achievements that are in it, and they are pervasive spiritual value. Somehow, science has lost some of this valuation of the sacred and the spiritual. And I think that actually artificial intelligence may bring help bring about what I what Jean Paul and I have called resacralization, making sacred again. Perhaps the art and science will help us. We plead for more for science, more than AI, to somehow combine the quest for accuracy with understanding and elegance, because we want to be in the company of the sacred to touch people as we have been touched by the joy of understanding. Some things are pretty clear. Images help. This is why, for instance, um, the books of Primo Levi and Oliver Sacks describing how they were drawn to chemistry by stinks, bangs, and vivid color changes are so wonderful. And there is a new generation of photographs by Theodore Gray and Yan Liang, which I I think some of you are familiar with uh, photographs of chemical processes which match in the, in the beauty that they convey the images of the Hubble telescope and now the Webb telescope are giving us of regions of outer, outer space. Perhaps in time, the future theorist making use of AI and quantum computing to play infinite games will find a way to make chemistry and physics closer to art, different ways of knowing the world, and will show us how we can touch the spiritual in us through that. Finally, I want to just tell you a little story. It's clear that I seek, we seek an equivalent position, one that reconciles the value of scientific understanding with the efficiency of simulation for individual human beings, for society, for the world. I give you some simple ideas which we have come up with. Uh, you don't have to follow us, 
into art in a sacralization, but at least make human move between experiment and theory, think of relationships, play, teach, ask why. These are simple things. Uh, the story is this. In an interview, Ed Wilson was asked, a great biologist, was asked to contemplate a meeting with an exoplanet civilization in the future. And he said, what would an alien civilization like to know about this one? Wilson said, look, they found us. They don't care about our science. We are juveniles to them. They would like to know very much about our culture. We've accumulated this immense mass of imagination and creativity in the creative arts. They would like to know what this is. This is our heritage. This is what makes us human. I have, we have a radical thought. Perhaps the artistic side will save science. And perhaps those alien visitors will stop here for a while to see the beautiful science and degrees of understanding that we have evolved. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you, Professor Hoffman, for this very inspiring and uh, <clears throat> encouraging talk. Uh, maybe it, uh, it has been like one hour and 15 minutes. Do you still have like five to 10 minutes for questions? Yes. OK. I have some. I'd be very glad to talk to people for a little while. Uh, OK. While I come down from the high of giving a talk, uh, I'll be glad to talk to people. Also, uh, the uh, lecture itself, you will make available in recorded form. I can also send a PDF of it. Um, okay, great. If you wish. But please ask questions. Sometimes it's difficult to ask questions. Whatever you want. Okay, maybe you, let's see. People in in Zoom. Uh, Hello, Professor Hello. Hoffman. Hello, Jun. Hi, that's Jun. Good yeah. to see you from. I know you. <laughs> yeah, Professor Ogin Schwarz also asked me to give his regards to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. It's a wonderful uh, uh, talk and a summary of the culture of science and the future thinking. So I think it was really great to talk. So my question is the following. You emphasize the importance of understanding chemistry. I fully agree. So currently, uh, we understand the chemistry based on, for example, quantum mechanics. So that means that if we have a law that is known before, then we will understand what we see. But if we don't know the future, then if there is a law, if there's no law, how do we understand this? So this is uh, something I. I think uh, I would like to hear what you hear about it. Yes, so um, the question could be rephrased also in terms of if we have intelligible AI and that intelligible AI gives us some special regularity which we see that uh, the, I don't know, that some, that the, some property of the molecule depends on some combination of observables. And we, supposing we didn't know it, even now, I think there are computers that are producing unusual mathematical theorems that mathematicians have not thought of, especially of the number uh, theory kind, the kind of sums of unusual numbers that Hardy and Ramanujan did. There are some being produced by computers, and then it is left for human beings to prove those. So I think there will be 
some regularities in chemistry that the computers will find that we have not thought of. And it will be left to us to try to think up ways why those things are. I cannot point to something specific. Um, there is um, something in the structure of, of papers that makes people produce papers giving the idea that they understand everything so that the things they predict are the result of some things that they know perhaps they are very smart and they know them but when something comes out that is correct but not known but there is no theory to lead to it um, people don't know quite what to do. Uh, one of the things you may have noticed, John, in, is that in there are a number of papers in computational chemistry where people get some result. And then when you go to the discussion section of the paper, they use old-fashioned or simple orbital arguments to produce an explanation. And the explanation looks like it's disconnected from what they did in the calculation. So they have not yet come up with something, something better. I don't have a good answer to your question. It's something to think about. Thank you, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. So I think uh, the simple uh, concept and models that uh, go beyond the number is really important to that uh, when we have a lot of numbers accumulated, then indeed the understanding become the top uh, concept. So eventually we will be able to get a, a concept out of the data. So this is why I also, uh, this is also what I learned from my advisor, Lu Jiaxi. Thank you for mentioning yes. him at the beginning. I pass your photo to his daughter, so she's really appreciated. Please, Thank please, you. yeah. <laughs> Send them to. You are of a generation of the students of these people. Please uh, tell them that I just that I remember them. I remember them vividly. They are before my eyes. So if you don't mind, I ask you another question that uh, I'm not religious and I hope I don't offend anyone in the audience, but also why our world follows some laws. For example, the molecules, uh, electrons follow the quantum mechanics. <laughs> this sounds like why? <laughs> I want to hear your thinking. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I don't Thank have you. any answer. But my answer is not a religious one, whatever it is. is I'm not, I'm not religious either. I feel like a spiritual human being, but I am not a religious one. What I mean by spiritual, I, I can only tell you by example, but I, I think I, what I mean by spiritual is that you, you have some experience, and in having that experience, you feel that you are together either with other people or with the universe through it. And I'll give you two examples. One often that people have is just looking at the Hubble telescope images, looking at those images of the a distant galaxy. That's a spiritual experience. And another one is listening to this. Yesterday, going to work, I turned on my car radio, and I have plugged in there uh, a recording of Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, some piano music by Bach. And that felt deeply spiritual. 
that felt like a tie. Now maybe it's culturally conditioned and it's tied to my culture, but it felt that in uh, in feeling something in that music, I was close to other human beings. That for me is the spiritual. Okay, not religious, but spiritual. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should not occupy all your time. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Be well. Thank you. And I, I have a question here. Uh, maybe you couldn't see it. Let me just uh, put it oh, here. I didn't look. Where should I look? In the chat? Yeah, but, but actually, yeah. I, I copied the question to me. And maybe I can read it to the audience. And, yes, please uh, read it to the audience. OK, so this is from Shi Liu. And this is a great talk. I have to ask a cynical question. It seems that in many cases, offering an accurate number is sufficient. For number, it could be a new compound or a new molecule of desired properties found by some machine learning algorithms. So how do we persuade the funding agency or the society that explanation or understanding is worth of the funding with tax money? Art is expensive. Uh, to remain human could be expensive as well. <laughs> yes. Oh, I am. First of all, I am so glad to hear that Chinese scientists share in our misery. Uh, meaning, by that I mean is that we struggle to convince our funding agencies to give us money for basic research. I mean, imagine the kind of work that you know that I have done over the years. Uh, I was lucky. Uh, there was one funding agency, the National Science Foundation, that gave money for such basic research. So it's a struggle. So the, the strategy used by people who work in industry for or work anywhere else is if you have a job which demands something of you like and if it is intellectual like predicting an active compound for a, a drug use uh, this is a cynical you you ask the cynical question you're going to get a cynical answer the cynical answer is use half your time to solve the specific problem that's given to you. Solve it well, very well. Make out that the problem is more difficult than half of your time. Make out it's, <laughs> it takes up all of your time. And then use the remaining half of your time to do what you want. Okay, so that's a cynical answer to a cynical question. No, we struggle. We struggle in various ways continually to, to ask questions of our governments, of, of the companies we work for. Um, I think it's possible to do both. In part of our work, we do something that's practical in, and uh, is a very specific a molecule or desired property or catalyst. And part of our work, it's possible within the process even of getting that new compound or molecule, don't lose track of asking at least for yourself why. Now, it could be that you are so overworked by your bosses or by the people who give you the contracts that you don't have time to ask that question. And then I, I am, I feel bad for you. Um, but this is a problem faced by scientists in every society that has found science of value. People want very specific applications, and why not give them some? But also, we want to understand it. Thank you. And uh, here is. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Uh, hi, Professor Hoffman. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So um, I like to resonate with your, your your title. The tension between simulation and understanding is not just limited to chemistry. I like to sort of briefly mention two subjects 
One is food mechanics. The other is linguistics, in which yes. this tension has been quite, you know, quite severe. And I think has there are some sort of conclusions already. We see some sort of conclusions already, and I think we can learn something from these two disciplines. Let me begin by food mechanics. So, when I was a graduate student, there are two. There were two schools of that study fluid mechanics. One is computational fluid mechanics. So these are people who do computing. The other are people, um, what we call British school, but it's not limited to just uh, British scientists. Uh, there were two very distinguished groups at Caltech and MIT. So these group of people, there were, you know, the pioneers were like um, George Stokes. So yes. the, the the, the Schrodinger equation in, in fluid mechanics is Navier-Stokes equation. So uh, George Stokes, and then there were um, G.I. Taylor, George Batchelor, and in the U.S., C.C. Lane, Paul uh, uh, Safman. These are all very distinguished scientists, and they emphasize understanding. So they would look at a fluid mechanics phenomena, come up with some qualitative model, and try to understand the the, the, the physics or the science behind the phenomena. So that's the Bridges School. But if you look at what happened now, the Caltech School and the MIT School are all but gone. And it's the compu computational side has completely overwhelmed the subject. So I think this is a very much a pity. And if you look at why, why this has happened, I think the most important reason is that the, the, the Bridges School was not prepared. They didn't see how much computation, how powerful computation could become. That's one thing. And the second thing is that they didn't point out a way of understanding. So at the time when Batchelor and G.I. Taylor, when they were active, the main theoretical understanding was about different kinds of instability. For example, mm -hmm. Calvin Helmholtz instability. Right. Um, Taylor instability, all kinds of instabilities. And, and you know, understanding these sort of things quantitatively is difficult. And very, very soon it becomes difficult to make progress along the same line. And they didn't point, point out uh, what would be the new questions to ask when things become complicated. So I think, you know, at the end of the lecture, you pointed out different categories of things one could do in order to sort of move beyond numbers, but you know, still understanding. I think that's very important, but in fluid mechanics, that was lacking. Yes. And the third aspect is that they didn't produce students. So they were very distinguished, but after they retired, nobody follows. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, fluid mechanics is at the stage for which we are computing. You know, everybody's computing. Everyone ask very yes. little about understanding now. So that's how yeah. that's the subject. That's the status of the subject. Yes. That's example number one. Example number two is linguistics. Now, I don't know whether you you look at the um, um, a few years ago, maybe ten years ago, there uh, uh, MIT was celebrating its maybe two hundredth anniversary. Yes. And Noam Chomsky, you know, arguably probably the most distinguished linguist came up and gave a short speech. And he was mainly trying to address the dilemma that he faced, that all, you know, all his life, he was pushing for um, the understanding of linguistics and with the practical application of something like machine translation. You know, machine translation is supposed to be a application of what they do. <laughs> but the fact yeah. of the matter is, the fact of the matter is this completely overwhelmed by machine learning yeah. methods. Right. So he tried to, try to give an explanation why. And his explanation was, well, you guys are doing very well in terms of the practical things like machine translation, but you don't understand the science. <laughs> but I think that's a very weak sign, very weak statement because if you look around, very few people care about the science of linguistics. And part yeah. of the reason was that they didn't tell people what's supposed to be important to be the science of linguistics. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the same thing that they were ill prepared for this new yeah. wave of new technology. So I would say, you know, if we go back to chemistry, I very much appreciate what you did in the end. I, I already said that, but I very much appreciate what you did in the end. And ask the question, we should ask the question, 
with the new technology, you know, AI is not going to go away. The machine learning is not going to go away. With the new right. technology, what are the new questions that we should be asking in terms of understanding? Yeah. And there should be many, many people, many, many chemists who cares about this in order not, you know, to, uh, in order to sort of avoid the, the traps, the other yeah. traps, you yeah. know, fluid mechanics. And, it's, and, when I go to, those are, uh, Wayman, those are, those are very good points. Uh, and I know a little about actually the, uh, the fluid mecha uh, mechanics from some people I know at, at Cornell mm -hmm. um, about this. Uh, and the linguistics I can understand very well. Uh, as I go around, I look what I do if I, I, I'm getting too old to travel too much, but as I go to places and talk to young physical chemists and other people who use machine learning and such techniques often, what I, I, I try to find out what they teach in their graduate courses, mm -hmm. because <sighs> If they turn it into just a course into computer techniques, then I can un I know where they're coming from. But usually they they try to find it's you can see my special interest in teaching. And it is this it is because human beings who are commanded to teach by their department, by their professor. They rise to the occasion and they teach. And when they teach, they really ask the question, do I understand this? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is the real importance of teaching. So I look at what people teach in courses because that teaches me what is important. The machine learning, yeah. But it is a, those are very good questions. I would like to continue the discussion with you and Jean-Paul would too. Um, and uh, we will do that. We will find a way to do that, to continue this discussion. But I'm glad that you, mm -hmm. to have given you a picture from the side of chemistry or theoretical chemistry of what this looks like. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for arranging this. Thank you for giving this very <laughs> inspiring talk. I mean, I think, I think we, we, we all of us should think about Think about the questions you're asking because this is going to be, um, you know, we, our our purpose is advanced advanced science, not just to yeah. predict numbers. Advanced science. So, what do we mean by advancing science yeah. in light of the new tools and new yeah. wave, overwhelming wave of these new tech, AI yeah. technologies? Oh, how it would have been nice to have someone like John von Neumann to talk about too about this. So they're <laughs> a pioneer of computing, but also an extremely thoughtful person and okay. other people. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. And maybe uh, one last question. There are still questions coming, but maybe we, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it might be already too late for you. So one last question is a rel relatively standard one, because uh, uh, now uh, we, <clears throat> Actually, uh, right now sitting, I, I think the room is filled by, maybe half of the room is filled by theoretical uh, or physical chemists. And uh, now we have a new institute, AI for Science Institute. And maybe just some a general question, what would you say to this new institute? And also maybe the scientists uh, at my generation, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have uh, I have, in some sense, said it in in the ending by uh, giving a a state uh, trying to say what one should do to move beyond numbers and to stay human in the process. Uh, the uh, to the I think the young people have gotten my 
my message about the importance of teaching uh, as a way of learning uh, and how how clearly I value understanding. There was one thing I said about playing games. So, so this is the, to the young people, the games I have in mind are not shoot me games, of course, anything of that type, but the kind of games which lead to further understanding and how to, to structure such games. Uh, also, there is another how to structure such games for teaching purposes. Anyway, my advice to young people is to to play, to try out any scientific tool to you, to try out its limits, uh, to try out to have it do things which it was not designed to do, just to test its limits. Of course, to try it out first on some molecule that you know, but then move to move to another molecule. You have seen in my work, those of you who know it, some of that playing. In some ways, the, the papers I did on square planar carbon are in that direction. What a crazy thing. Uh, but it was an exploration of how to use ML theory to stabilize things. And, to be taken more seriously. Chemistry is a wonderful universe. It will remain an important and viable science, and I urge you to have all the fun in the world while you do good science. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So then maybe we have to stop here. Thank yes, you. thank you so much. It's been a long day for me. For you, it's the beginning of a good day. <laughs> and I wish you, I wish you well. It was very good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Goodbye. I will stop sharing Bye. first. Bye to Bye. everybody.